As promised, here it comes, part two of our most frequently asked questions from our couples. I'm Alan Edwards, this is the Say I Do It With Fuse podcast, and we had a phenomenal response when we asked our Fuse Ceremony Celebrant team for the questions they are asked most by couples, whether that be prospective couples or those who have already signed up and are ready to get on that journey with their celebrant to plan their ideal and perfect humanist wedding. So we've already covered many, many aspects of the build-up to a wedding, the wedding day itself, and even some of the things that happen after a ceremony is complete as well. So let's continue the chat and continue the most frequently asked questions in the company of our wonderful Fuse Ceremonies celebrant team who have joined me on this episode. Oscar Gilchrist Grudnicki, George McLean, Susan Krenbrink, and Sam Conroy. And a wee question for you, Susan. We get asked a lot about music. Obviously, a lot of ceremonies they will have String quartets, harpists, pianists, singers takes care of itself in in that sense. But if they don't, and it's perhaps tracks being played through a PA system or, or whatever it may be, what responsibility, if any, do we have for that? So most of the time it is the wedding coordinator that would do that. So when I'm having my meetings with my couple, I advise them that they need to have um, four pieces of music, one for walking down the aisle, two for signing and then one for walking back out. And I ask them to liaise with their venue coordinator um, to do, you know, to to take care of the music. When I... um, arrive at the venue I'll check in with the coordinator as well and you know just double check that they've got those mu- that music sometimes we have um, venues that are a bit more DIY um, so I would ask them to nominate um, a guest um, yeah. and give them a, um, a part as well for them to coordinate the music um, it would be yeah it would be too much for us to um, stand and read it and then um, and go and find the track and everything on the phones and then play it so yeah we yeah. always um, delegate somebody else to do that One question I get asked a lot and uh, I, I know you, we all do. I don't want to speak out loud. Do I have to? Well, do you and to what extent? Well, there is a, always going to be somewhere in the ceremony that you do need to speak, and that's obviously your permitted legal vows. More specifically, the part where we legally marry you. Um, it has to be audio or audible to be able to hear what they're saying, but they don't have to shout for the back of the room to hear it as long as each other can hear it and the person marrying them can hear it then that would be absolutely fine some people are just quietly spoken you know it's not even that nerves have got in the way it's just that they don't have a big booming voice Um, and I always say to brides and grooms or couples generally if you're getting married um, be yourself so don't don't become something that you're not on a day when the person that you're marrying fell in love with you exactly as you are and if you're a quiet spoken person that's timid then don't go shouting your vows. Say them lovingly to each other because it's only really your ears that need to hear them. And mine, obviously. Of course. Quite quite important. And if you want to say the shortest version of the legal vows, Oscar, because that helps you feel more confident, then that's fine as well. Absolutely. I've actually had a couple who, beyond doing the legal vows, they wanted to do personal vows. But although the groom was very confident speaker, the bride wasn't so much. Um, so they've actually come up with promises to each other, but they asked me to ask the question and all they had to do was, I do, I will, I can. And that made it a lot easier for the bride to manage that, but they still wrote their own personal promises to each other and agreed to them in, in our presence as well. So there's ways around it that you can make it a little bit more digestible for couples. Yeah, if you want to do some form of personal vows, but you aren't much of a speaker, then by all means get us everyone would be wedding celebrants if we were all public speakers so <laughs> it's, it's much easier for, for us if that if it's much easier for you it is no problem for us we are more than used to reading out stuff on the couple's behalf I, I spoke to a couple last night who booked me for 2026 and the bride is already trying to convince her husband to be that he wants to do personal vows because she does <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if they've managed it by March of 2026 <laughs> fingers crossed Susan me question for you and they get asked this all the time. How long does a ceremony last? Um, on average, a ceremony would last about 25 minutes to half an hour. But the beauty about having a humanist ceremony is that it is completely tailor-made and bespoke to, to the couples. So I always say to my couples, if they're if they're including at least one symbolic gesture, um, their vows and a reading, that would normally last between 25 minutes to half an hour, which 
I think is long enough to keep everybody engaged, you know, really, really set the scene for the day, which is romantic, fun, and a wee bit of laughter. Romantic, obviously, is your wedding day, but really sets the scene for the rest of the day, um, off onto, onto party time, onto champagne and party time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you need to tell guests, if guests are wondering how long they have to sit without a drink, then... That, there's your answer. Absolutely, typically, yeah. sorry, maybe slightly <laughs> less, maybe slightly more. As you say, it just depends how much you want to include, really, yeah. in the ceremony. The more you want, the the slightly longer it may turn out to be. Uh, what about then? Uh, do we need to get married at, at that time because we've got relatives travelling for a, from a, quite a distance, and and we want them to be there? No, they can, you can get married any time of the day that you like. I always say to my couples when they are booking me that I only do one ceremony a day, so I'm free for whenever you need me. Um, so most ceremonies, but always check with your venue as well, but most um, ceremonies take place between 1 and 2pm. But there is a new popular trend now for the twilight weddings, um, which a lot of people are doing starting maybe about 6 o'clock at night and then going straight on to the evening reception. There's some beautiful venues which lend themselves really, really well to um, the Twilight Weddings and they're becoming really, really popular as well. So, um, yep, any time of the day at all. Um, um, you know, we don't worry about celebrant availability with that, Oscar, because, you know, I've got one in May where the couple are having pretty much, as Susan said, nice, simple ceremony straight into the partying afterwards. You know, we, we, we are there to take weddings at all times of the day. Absolutely. Um, and I think actually with having that ceremony a little bit later in the day, it lends itself in for that kind of golden hour photo shoot opportunity as well. Um, so it just kind of gives you a lot of other opportunities as well. And um, like I said, not everyone wants to do the big, you know, auditions wedding with um, big wedding meal, wedding breakfast and stuff like that. A lot of people prefer to things a little bit more informally. So you can do your ceremony followed by a photo shoot and going straight into dance and have a great Kaylee for the rest of the night. Cool. Right too. I actually had that last year. It was in a bowling club, and we did the ceremony. And then uh, the Kaylee band just kicked straight off, and uh, I was I was there for the first dance, which is quite rare for a celebrant. <laughs> but that was that was very nice. Um, what about uh, we've been asked this question? What, what do I do if someone I want to be my bridesmaid, my best man, they suddenly change their mind? Well. In terms of the wedding day itself, I don't think it really affects us as humanist celebrants all that much unless they are um, signing for the witnesses forms um, or on the marriage schedule as such. Um, if that happens, there isn't really much for you to worry about on, on that occasion. Um, we can reach out to the registrar and update them about the details and we can take the note of the alternative um, witness for your marriage schedule. This happens. That happens actually quite often. Um, and um, we've got procedures in place to make sure that this is covered for you as well. So something that you shouldn't really worry about, but knowing that you've got a plan B for whoever can stand in for that person would be absolutely brilliant because you don't have to panic about it all yeah. so much. Yeah, it's quite good, Susan, isn't it? Just to have a wee plan B just in case because, you know, sometimes circumstances out with your control can happen. Of course, yeah, absolutely. I had, uh, in fact, the same wedding last year that had the Cayley Band. The best man was a 50-50 beforehand. Right. I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it turned out he was fine. He did a wee accident the day before, but he, he soldiered on. It was wow. all right on the night. He was he literally all right on the night, which was, <laughs> was absolutely ideal. Now, lots of the questions we get asked by our couples or our prospective couples surround the, the legal part of, of getting married. That's the bit that a lot of couples find very daunting, which, first of all, you shouldn't do because your celebrant is there to guide you through all that, as are the registrars. There is plenty of help out there. But some of the questions just surrounding that, uh, Susan, I'll start with you. Uh, we are perhaps asked by a couple, are we the ones, as celebrants, the ones who fill in the legal forms? No, it's your couples. So when we have our meeting with our couples about the 12-week mark beforehand, we guide them through how to fill out the, the M10 forms which have to be filled out and submitted to the registry office closest to where they are getting married. So it isn't ourselves that fill the forms out. However, we are on hand um, with with guidance if they need any any assistance with that. But no, it's a, it's each of the couples um, fill out a form each and that gets submitted to the registry office closest to where they're getting married no later than 29 days before before their big day. But we do tend to recommend they do it more the, the three-month mark beforehand. Yeah, the earlier the better. Yeah, certainly can never be uh, never be too careful. Now, when it comes to the day itself, we, we get asked a lot: Do I need to say my full name, including my middle name, which I don't like and I never use, and nobody calls me by it? Do I have to say that out loud? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
is the long and short of it. I do get asked this question quite a lot and a lot of people say, oh no, do I really need to say that out loud? Can I just say it under my breath? A lot of people don't know that this is my middle name. Do you know what? We have a bit of fun with it. Unfortunately, yes, you do have to say your full legal name as per uh, what is on your marriage schedule. Um, but that wee bit where they do have to say their name out loud. Um, and if they are, we have a wee bit of a laugh about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You do, you do sometimes see couples, if maybe they, they go by a different name in everyday life and then a different name is mentioned at that point, you see some guests sort of looking and going, yeah. yeah. But but you can do it. And that is the only point, you know, if, if it's a name that for whatever reason you don't use a lot, you aren't particularly comfortable with, that is the only instance where that has to be said. The rest of the time you can be... Yeah. And do you know what? I think also it adds a wee bit of comic relief in because, you know, when people are saying their vows, it can be quite a tense, um, nerve-wracking moment for them. So if we are having a wee bit of a laugh with it, then it breaks that kind of tension up as well. Yeah. Here's a question, Oscar, that some couples will ask. Do we have to say on the day that we will obey one another? How very dramatic and formal. It is indeed. <laughs> um, and I think it is a kind of traditional um, aspect of ceremonies that you can, but you don't have to. Um, when it comes to legal ceremonies, there is no requirement for you to say the word obey. Um, the only thing that legal requirement has there is that you accept one another in marriage. And that's that's the way that you solemnise your marriage ceremony as well. But in terms of the obey, I mean, if you want to, by all means, you know, some couples are very traditional and they do promise and they want to say that to one another but actually in terms of the legal requirements it's not a thing that you have to do so you can personalise it a lot more Yes, uh, if you decide you maybe want to do it as part of the personal vows, maybe a wee bit tongue in cheek uh, yeah. then then by all means you know, you know, throw it in there but, uh, but no, no one's going to turn around and say you didn't say obey so we have to do it all again We spoken before about the 29 days, that's a cut off paperwork cannot be submitted any later than that or you're risking not having your marriage schedule in time for the ceremony now at the other end of that it also has to be returned to the registrar and we get couples who are saying they're maybe getting married on a Saturday and then on the Sunday they're jetting off to whatever it might be on their honeymoon with the, the flip flops and the sombreros and all the rest of it so what then if that is the case what do they do with the marriage schedule because of course registrars aren't then going to open again until the Monday in that case yeah, so anybody, obviously somebody trustworthy, um, can take it back um, to the registry office. So I always say to my couples, your schedule's ready to collect the week before your marriage, but either one of you have got to collect that. But obviously a lot of people do go on honeymoon straight away, so anybody can drop that off. Some of the registry offices have wee drop boxes um, outside as well that you can, you can drop them off. Um, but usually parents or somebody somebody uh, trustworthy can then um, drop that off for them um, and then their um, extract of their marriage licence will be ready for them coming back with their suntans yes <laughs> that's what happened when <laughs> I can buy honeymoon blues <laughs> <laughs> yes I can buy from my honeymoon with the blues but the certificate was through the door waiting for us which, there you was, go. which was quite nice <laughs> after a couple of weeks George, we question for you on the signing. A lot of couples will ask, you know, if if, if one of them is, is changing their name, how do they sign the marriage schedule? Is it their name that they're just about to take or do they do they sign as they have done all their life practically? Well, not everyone opts to change their surname after getting married. So the, the legal requirement is you sign in the name of your birth name and that happens uh, as per the, the, the forms that they've submitted uh, ahead of the, the time uh, but it's always a good practice I think as a celibate to just nudge because you already know if one of the party have chose to change their name or they've uh, maybe double, double barrel on their name or they've made on occasion a new name uh, that they're going to share uh, but they have to do it in their, their current name before they assume a new name because that's really all you're doing your birth name never changes uh, you're yeah. assuming a new name yeah yeah. I had a couple actually last year who decided they were going to merge their two surnames, so yeah. uh, they, they did that. But yeah, whatever way around it is. But what I've basically I suppose that the advice is whatever you've signed as up until that day, just keep signing like that for the marriage schedule purposes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. What about, obviously, rings are synonymous with weddings mm. these days, but are they a legal requirement? Are they essential? Well, they're a symbolic gesture. They're probably the world over. You show anybody a ring on your wedding finger, then you'll know, it doesn't matter what language it is, they know what it signifies. So it's not nothing legal about it. It's a symbolic gesture, just like hand fasting or drinking from the quake or candle lighting or any of the symbolic gestures that are very popular within humanist marriages, uh, wedding ceremonies. Uh, but there's no legal requirement. But I can't think of any time ever that... A couple's never done it yeah. uh, because it's just such a synonymous thing with marriage. 
Yeah. You ever had that, Susan? Any couple that have said that they're not doing rings or you've, you've, you've seen an alternative to that? I think um, probably over the years, maybe only about one couple. Um, and the couple that I can think of, they decided that they were going to buy each other a watch instead. Um, again, still a symbolic gesture. Um, they were going to do that afterwards. They both said that the, the jobs that they did didn't allow them to wear jewellery and they weren't really jewellery wearers as such. So they would prefer to buy each other a watch. So, yeah, yeah but most yeah. people do exchange rings. I, yeah. I had that as well where they've... Uh, I think uh, medical professions, you know, uh, nurses and uh, doctors and stuff like that might uh, not be allowed and uh, maybe someone who works in heavy engineering or something like that. Uh, but the couple I've got in mind that did that, they just had a kind of s- symbolic ring to use on the day just because they wanted to just make it a uh, a symbolism of their marriage. Uh, whether they used it after, I'm not too sure. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't fancy having rings for whatever reason, say we we haven't really come across it, but it's not entirely uncommon. Mm. Or if there's a practical reason why you maybe it's not going to benefit you having a ring on all the time, then you know you can you can have your wedding ceremony without. That is absolutely fine. Uh, we've discussed Susan the, the the legal vows already and the whole obey and accept and accept as the as the form. But um, what about if couples want to do? Something on top of that, 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 just because they want to do it. No, I always encourage my couples. Um, again, it depends on the personality of the couples if they feel quite confident in um, public speaking. But I always say, if you can, it always is so lovely if you can write your own vows and read them out um, to each other. And whilst you are in the presence of your friends and family, at that moment, you are making your promises to each other. So if that helps you to overcome that kind of anxiety of public speaking, just remember that you are saying these promises to each other. So, And that is one that is probably one of your few opportunities that you're going to get to do that in the presence of your friends and family so it is really really lovely and I over the years have heard so many beautiful personal vows and particularly from grooms as well who always say oh no I can't do that but then when they actually pour their heart out into the the personal vows oh there's so many times I've been very 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 close to not being able to continue afterwards <laughs> because I've been quite welled up but yeah, yeah. so yeah personal vows all the way for me no I have I've had that myself it was uh, two girls last year and, and one of them in particular and I'm like oh keep it together keep it together keep it together it'll all be fine and of course they don't uh, George all have to be if they want to do personal vows they don't all have to be all, all lovely dovey if you want to include some of the silly stuff in there as well and lighten it up have a nice little bit of light and shade that's fine as well oh 100% yeah often it's the silly things that will sort of break the ice and, and amongst the, the sentiment stuff uh, and, and the gushy stuff uh, someone might promise to always take the bins out on a Friday <laughs> or, or make sure there's a, a, a curry in, uh, on order for a Saturday night or, or, you know that type of thing run a bath for the, the other half coming in from uh, from work who knows uh, it is often really personal to them so it, although it's funny to everyone listening to it because it's a, a personal thing um, often it's kind of maybe got a wee bit of deep meaning and every tradition they have maybe as a couple yeah, and a lot of the time you hear some of these things and you can relate in your own relationship and of go, course, yeah. yeah, so you see guests <laughs> nodding heads, like, yes, that's us as well. You make them their, f- their favourite hangover breakfast, I get that quite a lot. Essential. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> when we go through the legal vow options, Sam, with couples, the, the, the four choices that they have, a lot of them will say, do we need to go away and memorise this? Do we need to know it off by heart and be expected, you know, with the celebrant standing there just going, okay, carry on. Does that have to happen? Absolutely not. Um, When you're doing your legal permitted vows, it's always as a repeat after me. So I think that straight away just alleviates all the anxiety, that kind of worry about speaking publicly or fluffing your lines, which actually you can still do because some of the words Mm. even I get solemnly (laughs) not always right. Um, That seems to be the one that people tend not to go for just because that might um, be the word that's uh, mis-said. But yeah... um, no, they don't need to memorise them at all. Similarly with, as we've just spoken about, the their own personal vows or personal promises, um, always encourage them to put the, the vows on a vow card or on mm. other occasions there's been times where I've had them in my folder and they've just taken the folder from me. Because mm. again, yeah. that's, that's a great way for them not to have to actually have an additional thing to worry about when they know that we've already got it prepared for them. So yeah. there's no obligation for anything actually to be memorised yeah. in the, the ceremony unless they absolutely want to do it, which of course will always be a choice for them. But in terms of the legal aspect of it, it'll be repeat after me. Yeah, nice and easy. And I think we're all quite equipped, George, aren't we? If, if there are like personal vows and stuff like that, we will always have our own copy, whether that be because the couple forget their copy or they maybe all of a sudden last minute turn around and just stage fright 
can't deliver the vows, then then we've got the option of, of doing it on their behalf. Yeah, part of the planning uh, with meetings and check-ins with our couples, we always double-check who's saying what, when are they saying it, what are they reading from, and I think we always make sure we've kind of got the belt and braces approach of, even though someone might say, yeah, we're, our stationer's making these beautifully presented vow cards and stuff like that, I've always got a copy with me, yeah. and I've always got a copy in the folder. It's a bit like fountain pens. Um, you know, you've always got ink for your fountain pen, a spare fountain pen, and a spare pu- fountain pen for the spare fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, because that's the kind of that's a question actually we, all, we often get asked as well is about you know can we use our own pens? Yes. Um, and legally, the signing of the marriage schedule has to be done in a uh, a fountain pen, which is legally scribing the paper yes. and inking the paper at the same time. It's law. Uh, couples don't need to rush out and buy these on occasion they might have got one as a beautiful sentimental keepsake um, and but they let us know yeah. uh, and it's always a case of just making sure you test it ahead of the time <laughs> so get there as we do nice and early and if they're using their own fountain pen hasn't happened that lot often to be fair with me I've had it maybe twice I think uh, I've been to settlement seven years where someone has a, a sentimental pen mm. or someone's bought them it but I got there nice and early to make sure the ink is flowing because that's the big thing with fountain pens is even though you haven't used it for seven days, it still dries <laughs> up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I've had someone ask me. They had a lovely gold pen that they wanted to sign the schedule with. I said, nope. Yeah, Unfortunately no, not. points are out. <laughs> yes. Sorry about that, but no, fountain pen. But we will provide it so you don't have to, to worry about spe- and it, You've got enough expenses on the go when you're planning your wedding day so you don't have to worry uh, about organising that. Um a wee question for you, Sam, about the, the quake, which is one of our uh, more popular symbolic gestures, drinking from the quake, sharing a drink from the cup of life, and all the sweeter because you share it together. Now, the tradition with the quake, and all the symbolic gestures have their own traditions, of course, is that a wee nip of whiskey is taken from it. So if you're not a whiskey drinker, does that mean then that you can't do the gesture? Again, absolutely not. Um, obviously, traditionally, whiskey has been the drink of choice to go into the quake. But we are not traditional people often in Scotland, are we? We like to have a bit of variation, so anything at all. And I think with the whisky as well, you might have people that just simply don't drink alcohol. So mm-hmm. that discludes them straight away from being able to take a drink from the quake. So they might want a soft drink mm-hmm. or you know, water or something. So all of those options are perfectly um, acceptable for, for the quake. Yeah. But I think my personal favourite in terms of Scottish is when you still try to put a bit of Scottish tradition in it and you have like Iron Brew or you've got your Buckfast <laughs> or you've got <laughs> one of the more um, sort of non traditional but traditional Scottish elements yes. to it. But it's everybody's personal choice. I've, I've seen Prosecco go into it, I've seen April Spritzies go into it, I've seen Gin go into it. Um, although I don't know if any of you guys have ever done gin straight and it's not it's not uh, pleasant. Yeah. I think whiskey would be slightly <laughs> better than that. But it's a symbol of machine, yeah, isn't absolutely. it? Doing it absolutely. at the same time. Yeah. Especially with the the kind of new trend of one of the taking a shot. Yeah, tie the knot, take uh, a shot. Tie the knot, take a shot, or just doing a shot together as yeah. the, the last act. Uh-huh. That's what I did the... at my wedding and it was um tequila that my husband and I did and we invited uh, yeah yeah we invited four of our guests to join us as a complete surprise so they were absolutely no idea (laughs) what they were doing just that they had to come down and join us at the front but we had everything set up and it was your traditional tequila and yeah. how you do it. So we had the salt, we had oh, the lemon. Oh, the lemon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The lemon. Um, oh, everything, everything was going on there. Um, we wanted to set the tone that everybody was to relax, have yeah. a good time and clearly get drunk. Um, <laughs> but it was so it was so good. And the pictures as well, that's the thing at the end mm. of it were really, really good. The so tequila rose seems to be a bit of a, yeah. Well, a yeah. popular one. And, but the brides, if they've got a nice white dress on or whatever, and grooms, of course, <laughs> to a light-coloured kilt or whatever, yeah. they kind of almost like lean over. <laughs> Uh, to do the shot, you know, so they I, don't get any spillages. I get to Killer Rose mentioned to me quite a lot, and then I'll say, "Well, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but just remember, you've uh, spent, I'm sure, a lot of money on that beautiful dress, and uh, if anything happens to it." I've had a couple of weddings as well where we've had champagne popped. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So instead of having a quake and instead of doing the shot, we've had the champagne getting popped. In fact, mm-hmm. one couple um, who really, really, really wanted to do the champagne, but we're keeping it specifically for the wedding and she was an absolute fan of Misery um, so she wanted the same bottle of champagne that appeared in the Misery film and when she walked <laughs> back up the aisle 
um, we popped the champagne and we did an additional toast to celebrate the marriage oh. between Anything's her and her husband. Yeah. So that, was, that sticks out of my mind because obviously uh, Miseries, if you've not seen it, watch it. It's great, an absolutely classic film. But yeah, the only thing about the champagne I would say is that um, the cork can pop uh, before it's ready to. So I did do oh, a wedding brilliant, brilliant. recently where champagne was being popped. Luckily, it went straight up and not anywhere else, so nobody was injured in the process of this champagne <laughs> corkage. Uh, but it can, depending obviously the just the, the situation that the champagne bottle's sitting in, but yeah, I've seen the cork go off, not when it's meant to. <laughs> <laughs> How rude. Yeah, just a couple of examples from me on the quake. I had a couple last year where the groom uh, had been sober for a number of years and he was keen on the idea, wasn't quite sure. And just as we were discussing their story, and they sort of said to me, do you know what? We're just a wee bit kind of boring. We're just like watching Coronation Street and having a cup of tea. I says, there you go. So get your venue to make you a flask of tea, which they did. <laughs> flask of tea sat on the signing table and then we poured that in and uh, and they had a wee cup of the hardcore, quake, hardcore. which was really nice. Coronation Street <laughs> we should have done that, actually. In fact, yeah. there was a pianist at that wedding. He could just have jumped in and, uh, and, and, and tinkled away. And then uh, it was actually a renewal of vows, this one I did, where they, they had the tequila rose, but they also arranged for all their guests to have a tequila rose. So as soon as we got to that moment and they had the quake, all the guests took a wee... I mean, shot tequila rose as well. So, uh, I mean, there's there's some brilliant examples of yes, do the quake and do pretty much what you want with it. If you're not a whiskey drinker, if you are more traditional, that's absolutely fine as well. Does anyone know of any just impediment why these two people should not be legally joined together in marriage? Do we do that? Well, absolutely not, because that part is already done through the application for marriage notices, and the registers will check that impediment has not been broken there. But um, Quite interestingly, you see that quite a lot of um, times in the films or you might have heard it sometimes in the past in ceremonies taking place. I incorporate that as a bit of a joke to my ceremonies and then ask for the guest's commitment to support the couple in their marriage. But it's not a legal requirement. We don't have to do it and it's not a done thing normally. No, you will not turn your head around and look around and see if anybody's got a suspicious look. It'll all be fine. Uh, maybe something else here, Sam, that you, you see you know, in films and on the telly is when you see a couple and they get engaged and it's all beautiful and then the next, the very next day they just go into whatever venue it is and they get married there and then. Mm. Can that happen in Scotland? Not in Scotland. Vegas, maybe. <laughs> Elvis, maybe conducting the ceremony. But I would question if it was legal just because they're probably Berlin. <laughs> but in Scotland, no, they absolutely can't do that. We've got a legal requirement and a process to go through for application of marriage. Um, and at bare minimum, it's 29 days before the ceremony. And that is the bare minimum, obviously, we want it to happen well in advance of that. That's why they give us the 12-week window. So to be able to get engaged one day and married the next um, would need to be absolutely um, extenuating circumstances. And saying that, it could be that somebody is perhaps terminally unwell and that the couple have decided to get married for that reason, in which case the registrars would consider that as an exceptional circumstance and they may grant um, the marriage licence after that, the marriage schedule, eh, based on that fact, but it would need to be really exceptional circumstances for that to happen. In normal everyday life, in terms of couples that are planning a wedding, they wouldn't accept that as a reason. We are just got engaged and we absolutely just want to be with each other within 24 hours. Is not a, a good enough reason for a, a wedding schedule in Scotland to be granted. I mean, it's a bit of a shame with all these movies and TV shows, Oscar, because then you miss all that wedding planning section out. <laughs> they just Absolutely. go straight to the big day itself. It was quite funny, actually. I've got a story with my brother-in-law who was planning to get married through COVID and they were supposed to get married in Cyprus. And it was all planned and wonderful. And actually, um, only about two or three weeks before the wedding, they were told that it's not going to happen. The flights are getting cancelled left, right and centre. So they have inquired with the registrar here in Scotland saying, can we do host the ceremony here in Scotland? And the registrar said, absolutely not, because there's no extenuation circumstances here. Nobody is ill. There's no terminally ill illness in the family. So actually, you're going to have to follow the same process as everyone else as well. So you might not quite get a Hollywood moment like the movies, but thanks to the Fuse Ceremonies team, we hope that your wedding will be something of a fairy tale. Thanks to all this great advice and knowledge. My thanks to Susan Krembrink, Sam Conroy, George McLean and Oscar Gilchrist Grudnicki for joining me on this episode of the Say I Do with Fuse podcast. And we hope that the answers to our most frequently asked questions have helped you in many different aspects of your wedding planning. Remember, if you've already booked your Fuse Celebrant, you can contact them anytime 
with any question. We are always here to help and be that guiding hand. If you missed part one of our two-part Frequently Asked Questions podcast, don't worry, it's available to enjoy any time. You can listen right now, in fact, and to subscribe to the Say I Do It With Fuse podcast. That will mean that as soon as a new episode drops, you'll get notified on your device and you can download it to enjoy any time. Make sure you scroll through the series so far as well. Lots of great advice and tips for planning the perfect humanist wedding. I'm Alan Edwards. Thank you for listening and happy wedding planning.